Hello everybody! The next plane off the pile is a Stanley number 18 block plane. Let's take a look at it. Stanley made the number 18 from 1888 to 1950. This old girl was made somewhere between 1920 and 1929. It is 6 inches long and has a 1 and 5 8 inch wide cutter. The cutter sits at a 20 degree angle for general purpose work. It has both a depth and lateral adjustment and the throat opening is adjustable by using that eccentric lever. At first glance I don't see any obvious flaws. The average book value of this plane is thirty to forty five dollars. The older ones are much higher. The type one can go as high as hundred and fifty. This plane has the knuckle joint lever cap. Stanley also made planes with the pivot lock lever cap that you see right there. That's on a Stanley 203. The Stanley number 18 and the number 19 block plane look almost identical. The only difference is the 19 is 7 inches long and this 18 is 6. It's time to break her down. And with all the parts accounted for and appearing to be in good shape, it's time to scrub the bottom, the eccentric plate and the lever cap with some simple green, a toothbrush. I'm going to do that in my deep sink. And with the parts all cleaned up, I can see that the Japani is about 90%. Nickel looks good. So the next thing I'm going to do is start cleaning up the metal. I'm going to use my scraper with a fresh burr to clean up the flat surfaces and all those parts you see right here. The old scraper makes short work of surface rust. And next I'm going to use a sanding sponge on the sides of this bottom. I want to see what it, what it looks like, if I want to retain the patina or not. It doesn't take long using this sponge to see what the metal is going to look like. I'm not happy with the looks. I mean it's good. But I'm going to go ahead and lap this one so it will be nice and flat. But first all the small parts go into the plastic tub for later. And the next thing I'm going to do is take the recesses right here on my wire wheel and clean them out. Same thing for the notches on the back of the iron. And the back side of the eccentric plate. And with that done I'm going to reinstall the eccentric plate and take it over to my lapping station. I'm going to lap both sides and the bottom. I'm lapping front to back in the direction of the original machine. Oh look at that already. It's not going to take much at all to get this down where it's supposed to be. And I'm glad I decided to lap it because about 16 strokes across the paper took it from this to this. It was well worth about a minute and a half worth of effort. Now I got to finish the other side and the bottom. Hopefully these will be just as easy. And that's it for the side. He's looking really good and it's on to the bottom. You want that eccentric plate in there. Otherwise the, the plate is going to be sticking up higher than what the newly lapped rest of the bottom is. Both sides and the bottom are looking really good now. There are a couple spots that didn't get lapped right up here towards the front and just ahead of the throat. I'm going to take care of those with 150 grit sanding paper on both sides and the bottom. That will just be the sanding block keeping it flat going in the same direction as I did with the lapping. I can nose it down a little bit by the throat take care of that uh, dark spot that was there and get these front corners. And I'm going to continue with the 150 grit paper to do around the edges. It'll be all around here, the back and the front. I still have the eccentric plate in and it's flush with the front of the plane so I get both parts at the same time. Now I'm doing the back. You want to keep your sanding block square. You don't want to be rounding the edge of this plane over. I set it down on my bench to get the top edge. I put that paper towel underneath because if this thing slips and slides around and I've got any grit at all, it's going to take that nice pretty bottom surface that I've got almost perfect and it's going to scratch it up. Next I'm going to use the sanding stick, wire brush and steel wool to clean up the machine surface right here at the back of the throat and this machine surface right here. You want to keep your sanding stick perfectly flat. 
you can see as you're doing it how the uh, darkness is going away and use that to judge uh, where you need to apply pressure. The wire brush, it'll get down in the little machining grooves and follow that up with some steel wool. And with that looking really good, it's time to work on the japanning. There's about 90% at least is left on here. There's some pretty good looking japanning. Where it's missing, there's a bunch of it missing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to steel wool that japanning. A little more aggressive where the japanning is gone to get rid of the surface rust that's there. And then I'm going to use my, uh, my paint marker to touch it up. The steel wool will dull the japanning, but the brightness is going to come back when we do the finishing steps. If your goal is to have japanning that looks perfect when you're done, then you don't want to use paint markers. You're going to have to strip it all the way down to bare metal and then put a new finish on. The purpose of using the paint markers, in my mind, is to prevent any more loss of japanning and make it look a little bit better. Because wherever that stuff has come off, there's a ridge right here. And applying more paint over top of that ridge, there's still going to be a ridge. You never, It's not going to go away unless you feather it in or strip it off. I use my smaller paint marker to get into the chips. I try to apply it just on the spot where the chips are. And here's how the touch up looks after it's been applied. The next thing I want to do is the underside of the lever cap. To get at that I'm going to use my sandblaster. That's got it looking a lot better. Now I got to get in there with the wire brush and some steel wool and finish polishing the nickel back up. The underside of the lever cap cleaned up pretty good and the top looks pretty good too. Looks like all the nickel is there. It looks a little bit rough. What I'm going to try doing here is use my sanding sponge and buff it up and if that's good enough then I'm going to go over to my uh, buffer, the actual buffer, and polish it out. After just a couple minutes with a sanding sponge I can see there's quite a few small dings like all over the outside of this thing. So I'm going to go over it with some 1000 grit paper before I take it over to the buffer. That 1000 grit paper is going to shine it up really nice. And that's quite an improvement from what it was before. I've gone over the japanning with a touch up about two or three times. Now it takes time to take some 4 out steel wool and just kind of even up the tone by lightly steel wooling over top of that new paint. You don't want to go crazy with this. You just want to dull it up just a little bit and feather it if you can. And that's how it looks after the steel wool and it's time to break out the dirty oil rag. There it is. Same old rag used for many many years. That's why it's the dirty oil rag and that's the oil that's in it right there. Howard Feed and Wax. I'm going to completely coat that bottom, the eccentric plate, and the underside of the lever cap. The dirty oil is the first step in making that new paint on the japanning start to blend back in and look like the old stuff. Well, there's all the parts dirty oil applied and it's on to cleaning up the iron. So I'm going to 150 grit paper on the sanding block. Going to do both the top, bottom, and the edges. You can do your edges with the sanding block like this or you can do them on a lapping station. While you do this just make sure you keep the paper parallel to the surface that you're working on. You don't want to round those edges over. I'm sanding the iron in the direction of the original tooling marks. If there's too much pitting or it's too hard to use the sanding block Sometimes I go over and do this on my lapping station. The iron cleaned up good 150. Now I'm just hitting it real light with some 1000 grit paper. Not doing a whole lot. That's all I wanted to do. And now that I've got a nice looking sweetheart iron, it's time to sharpen it up. In order to perform at its very best, this part of the iron right here, the, the back side of the bevel, needs to be perfectly flat. Flattening the back side of the iron happens over here in my lapping station. I got about three quarters of an inch of the iron on the paper. Even pressure, working from left to right. With it flattened with 150 grit paper, it's time to move on to 1000, 3000, 5 and 7000 grit paper doing the same thing. Just like the 150, I'm working it left to right. And you want to look and see that you're taking all the scratches out. After making about 25 strokes back and forth, I'd like to finish it with a swirling motion. And there she is, looking pretty good. With that done, it's time to sharpen the 25 degree bevel. And right there you can see I took a fine tip sharpie and I drew a square line across the back side so I can make sure I keep that cutting edge square. 
I'm going to lock that iron to my general number 810 blade sharpener and sharpen it up. Long strokes, even pressure, going to make short work of it. As you can see, I didn't have to do a whole lot. The 25 degree bevel is just on the very leading edge. And just like the back side, I'm going to finish it with 1,000, 3, 5, and 7,000 grit paper. And there's a look at the back side of the iron and the front side. She looks really good. And the last thing to clean up is the small parts. You want your sandpaper to fit nice and snug when you go to clean out all the crud and rust that's in there. And with the small parts looking great, I want to point out one thing. Those two parts right there, the front knob and the adjustment nut, they were originally nickel coated. So you're seeing the brass that so shows through now. And now's the point where I apply the rim oil. I'm only going to put it on those three parts right there. I'm not going to put it on the lateral adjustment lever and the eccentric lever because I don't want them to darken. And with everything done, it's time to wipe off the oils and give everything except for the small parts a coating of paste wax. The oil's off, the wax is on, and it's time to put this old girl back together. And there she is. I love seeing how they look after you put them back together. And the old girl's looking pretty good. I hope she works as good as what she looks. The lateral and depth adjustments work nice and smooth. And the sides and the bottom look outstanding. The only notable apology on this plane is there are some tiny little chips right there on the edge of the throat. It's time to take the old girl for a test drive. And for this test drive, I'm going to challenge the old number 18 with a 7 eighths of an inch wide piece of walnut. I think it's safe to say that she is up for the challenge. This old girl is definitely up to the test. And she passes with fine colors. And there she is all tucked in in her bed of shavings. And there's a look at how tight the throat was for doing the work that I did right there. And just to show the difference, there's the throat in the full open position right there. The adjustable throats are a nice option because you can tighten them up and prevent the wood from lifting and tearing out in front of the iron. That's it. Another great restoration. Like everything else, this number 18 is for sale if anybody's looking for a great block plane. Well, it's breakfast time in Australia, which means it's time for supper here, so i got to go. Bye.